Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du Fred Astaire Revoir un latte There's a lot going on, including a new announcement today from the FBI. Now, the Bureau doesn't typically comment on personnel, especially on State of the Union Day. So consider the context. Reports last week that the FBI director threatened to resign over Trump's effort to oust the deputy there, Andrew McCabe, a story the White House didn't even deny. And yet today, that FBI director, Ray, publicly explaining why the number two is out, just like Trump wanted. The reason? Ray cites an internal review of McCabe, the number two linked to Hillary Clinton, the same case that was a pretext for firing Comey. If you're keeping score, Trump wanted Comey out because of Russia, but his DOJ said it was because of Clinton bias. And Trump wanted this official McCabe out, and now the FBI says, wait for it, it's all because of Clinton bias. You know, an observer might get the impression the White House isn't even working very hard on these cover stories anymore. They're the same story. And put that in this context of the wider purge. FBI Director Comey fired. His deputy, as we're reporting, attacked by Trump, now out. Bob Mueller. Trump attempted to fire him. Then Trump attacked Comey aide Jim Baker. He's been reassigned. Then this week, we have, of course, Mueller's boss, Rod Rosenstein, facing these Trump attacks and reports he's a target in this secretive memo slated for release. And Trump has long blasted Jeff Sessions for recusing from Russia. So if you look at this picture, any one of these moves against these men might be explainable. But taken together, we are seeing, going into this State of the Union, a relentless campaign against every senior investigator involved in the criminal probe into the Trump White House. It may not be a Saturday night massacre, partly because it's not all going down in one Saturday night. But what if the purge is chasing the same Nixonian goals, but spread out slowly instead of one lawless night? Students of history are now asking that question. It looks like a slow motion Saturday night massacre. I wonder if some people in his entourage at least have studied the Saturday Night Massacre. It's not that Nixon did it, it's the way he did it, and that maybe he would have gotten away with it is if he had done it more slowly and more obliquely, and maybe that's what we're seeing today. Joined now by Michael Waldman, President Clinton's former chief speechwriter for four State of the Unions and an attorney, and back with me, the Reverend Al Sharpton, who's covered the last six State of the Unions for MSNBC. Uh, Michael, the challenge going into a State of the Union with this kind of controversy and the question about whether this is a slow motion massacre. Well, he's giving this State of the Union the kinds of questions you always ask. Should it be optimistic or pessimistic? What's the policy agenda? But he gives this with a dark cloud of impropriety hanging over his head. He is acting guilty. Mm -hmm. The question is, why are the Republicans choosing to act guilty along with, with him? him? We've got what is plainly an attempt to subvert our democracy by a hostile foreign power and an attempt, as you say, in a way we have not seen since Richard Nixon, to go after law enforcement that's investigating the president. It's, like, it's an immunization. We're, get, we're getting used to these one at a time. But it's really quite an extraordinarily egregious abuse mm -hmm. of power of a kind we have not seen in a long time. And if you go back to Nixon, Rev, take a listen to the way he tried 
uh, to tackle a similar challenge in his State of the Union. I believe the time has come to bring that investigation and the other investigations of this matter to an end. One year of Watergate is enough. Rev, he, like this president, felt that he should decide how long an investigation goes. And I think that that was something that did not help Nixon. And if Mr. Trump tries that tonight, it will not help him. I think that one of the things, Kathleen Parker said it right, how do you handle the presidency? Many people are going to look at tonight whether or not he has grown into the presidency. And if he comes with something like that, which really dispels the function of justice departments and, and investigations, it shows the inadequacy of his learning curve mm. in the first year. Well, if this president talks about law and order, as presidents tend to do, it will, there will be ashes in his mouth after something like this. <laughs> it, we're, we're, it'll be pretty interesting because a year ago, crime was way down, uh, decades low. And he said, it's American carnage. We need harsh new laws. Now crime is still down. And Jeff Sessions is saying that's because President Trump's policies have worked. It's sort of uh, chutzpah in Alabama, would be the way I would say it. It is Wednesday, January 31st of 2018. And you are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. It is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. That's what we do on Wednesdays here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Well, the morning after the State of the Union, um, that was quite something, wasn't it? All sugar and nice in the beginning, and then he starts giving us uh, rancid meat of MS-13. You know, (laughs) I thought all of us were God's children, and Trump thinks that all Hispanics are MS-13. So, uh, the American carnage that he, uh, he just wishes for, um, may be long in coming. I thought, uh, it was horrendous that the families of the dead kids, uh, by MS-13, maybe they were kids, their children who were killed by MS-13, I thought it was horrendous that, uh, they were put through the that the the grief that they still feel and i got to tell you i think the idea that we should always have in our heads that if something or someone perpetrates some evil upon us it is not a whole group of people who have done it i know it's hard I used to hear that argument. In fact, uh, I remember remember my dad having, an, well, a discussion with a, a neighbor in Southern California who just happened to be a little bit uh, with the, I don't know, KKK, White Citizens Council of uh, San Gabriel Valley of Southern California. I remember him telling my dad, yeah, well, you know, when I was younger, a black guy hit me. Now I hate all blacks. Mm-hmm. So, I thought that to be evolved human beings, we were to rise above that. My dad, obviously, I mean, had the obvious answer. You know, one person did that to you, and now everybody could do it to you. And, of course, the guy walked away saying, well, that's just the way I am. That's the way I feel. He can't change me. Okay, can't change you. And uh, I, I got that at an early age. And uh, the modern Trump voter seems not too much dissimilar. And they will never change. Ever. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we've got a lot on uh, the, uh, the table today. So why don't we take a gander at what we have here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as our offerings on Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Well, of course, that was uh, Ari Melber and his panel describing Trump's slow motion Saturday night massacre. It's slow motion. I It, it may be uh, picking up some speed. And uh, boy, uh, a lot happened yesterday. And the day before. Well, on the rest of the menu, uh, the Republican hoping to unseat Paul Ryan. 
posted a list of Jews in the media who are out to get him. God, I wish I could be on that list. A Trump public health official bought and sold tobacco stocks on the job as the CD director to reduce tobacco use. And, (laughs) yeah, I like that. And Russia's attempt to broker a Syria peace deal ends in disaster. Well, of course. After the break, we'll move to the chef's table, where one year after Thomas Countryman delivered farewell remarks to his colleagues, after he and five other top State Department officials had been suddenly discharged by the Trump White House, well, Countryman provides yet again deep insights into the world of public servants and into the true state of our union. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Don't say maintenant Sous l'été Les pieds nus dans le sable Don't say maintenant Et jetez vos ennuis dans les parcs Well, as you know, our homepage had been down for oh, the last couple of days. Um, one of our vendors had done a what they called an industry-wide security fix, and uh, there were some other things that we had to do, and uh, a, another group of vendors that we work with had to do as well. So that took a little bit of time to get everything pointed properly. But our homepage and player are back up at netrootsradio.com. So that is a good thing. Uh, Our uh, Netroots Radio uh, uh, email, for some reason, is not working. There's been a lot of things as we've been making this transition here uh, in our personnel (laughs) changes that we've had at the station. So uh, a lot of things that I have had to figure out and some of the other crew members have had to figure out since... There were some things that were maybe a little too closely held. So we've been opening those up. And uh, I never did like the uh, vendor that did our uh, uh, Netroots Radio email anyway. A lot of lot of spam, uh, a lot of stuff coming in, uh, things getting kicked out, uh, loading up the mailboxes. So I will have to look for something else. But you can uh, reach me. Uh, how would you reach me? I guess uh, uh, friend me. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter. DM and I'll give you. Uh, I don't know if I should say my Gmail address over the air. Nah, heck, I will. Just email me at justiceputnam at gmail.com. And I'll try to get. Uh, I, I have to get a hold of, of all of our talent and uh, folks that are. Uh, podcasting on netroosradio.com to let them know that uh, contact me at Gmail. <laughs> okay, I don't know. It's it, it's a lot of stuff to, to get a hold of, and we are. So why don't we... Oh, I forgot to mention, since our homepage is back up, if you go to the bottom of the homepage, there is the chat room link there at the rightish and the don- donate contribute buttons on the leftish of the homepage there. And uh, thank you for your generosity. That's how we pay the bills. And yeah, those vendors charge. So thank you. We just keeping the infrastructure going. OK, that's that's the most important part. OK, um, why don't we get into the first dishes here? at uh, the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I should mention also that the podcasts of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy can be had by way of Spreaker, and I post them, uh, I post the links to the podcasts on social media, and there is also a link to the podcast archive on the show notes and links diary that I put up each day for West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy at Daily Co's. So go there, too. All right, this first article is out of Newsweek by Michael Edison Hayden. Paul Nalen, a Republican who is attempting to unseat GOP House Speaker Paul Ryan in Wisconsin, posted on his Twitter account what he claimed is a list of Jews in the media who have attacked him within the last month. Oh, good. 
Yes. <laughs> a list of Jews. Wow. His list plays into a false white supremacist conspiracy theory that suggests Jews control the media and are deliberately using it to further their interests at the expense of other people. Yeah. We're going to... I, I, I am part Jewish. I should, should, I guess, divulge that little secret, even though I was baptized Catholic. And, um, yeah, we... We want to drink the blood of your babies. That's what we want to do. Unbelievable. Well, such conspiracies have long been floated, and they are now on the rise, according to rights groups. And this is not the first time Nalen has attempted to draw links between Jews and the media. Critics from both the left and the right have called him a Nazi in response to his views. Newsweek reached out to Nalen for comment about his views, but did not immediately receive a, a response, and he has not responded to numerous previous requests for comment, because Newsweek is full of Jews. Everybody knows that. I have compiled a list of verified Twitter users who have attacked me in just the last month alone for my America First positions, Nayland wrote, returning to his favorite subject of those 81 people, 74 Jews, while only 7 are non-Jews. Well, a cursory glance at Nayland's list shows that statement to be inaccurate. For example... Newsweek has twice reported on Nalen for his campaign's use of anti-Semitic memes on social media and for his promotion of a book by Kevin MacDonald, a writer beloved by neo-Nazis for purporting to show the degree in which Jews function inherently in opposition to white Christians. And the reporter was misidentified on the list as being Jewish. He is Catholic and of Egyptian descent. Also misidentified identified was Yasher Ali, a contributor to New York Magazine and HuffPost, who has Persian roots. Well, that does mean he's a Caucasian, doesn't it? Hmm. I see you have me on this list, Ali said. I'm not Jewish, I'm a practicing Roman Catholic, but I'm in some pretty good company on the list, so feel free to say that I'm Jewish. Well, I'm not a verified Twitter user. I should be. Shouldn't I? And, um, I, I want to be on the list. Okay. I got some Jewish stuff in my uh, DNA, if you go by that uh, sort of uh, construct. Ah, oh, boy. Okay. Thor Benson, a freelance writer, also reported that he was misidentified as being Jewish. Nalen, who has, to put it as gently as possible, run a controversial campaign in attempting to take Ryan's seat in Wisconsin. He has posted a number of anti-Semitic memes on social media, as well as memes that were created by the alt-right and promoted with the help of overt white supremacists such as David Duke. Yeah, David Duke uh, praised uh, Trump's State of the Union speech, the part that where Trump said, all Americans are dreamers. Yeah. And those dreamers, they're not Americans. So they're not really dreamers. Only we Americans are dreamers, and they're not Americans. God, these people. Okay. All lives matter. Jesus. Nalen was briefly suspended from Twitter last week prior to posting the list. National Vanguard, a white supremacist organization based out of Charlottesville, Virginia, wrote that Nalen had been forbidden from communicating with voters and the public on Twitter because he criticized Jewish media power. A statement from Nalen's campaign argued that his post clearly did not violate the Twitter rules in any way. The Wisconsin GOP has not commented to Newsweek on allegations of anti-Semitism related to Nalen's campaign. And why should they? <laughs> we know where they're at. Okay. Now, Nalen's tweet was part of a thread that included a graphic in which employees of CNN were marked with Jewish stars. It's a graphic that is heavily circulated on the internet platform 4chan and on alt-right social media where Jews are falsely blamed for everything from the investigation into allegations that, allegations that Trump's campaign colluded with Russia to the spread of pornography. Well, and also uh, babies disappearing and then being offered up as blood offerings and uh, sacrificed. Yep. I fear a pogrom is in the offing here. Could be. 
Let's see. Paul Nalen, Stephen Miller, Joe Arpaio, Steve Bannon, Roy Moore, and Trump-esque candidates are the future of the Republican Party. Wajahat Ali, a contributing op-ed writer for the New York Times, tweeted in the aftermath of Nalen's publication of his list. The Frankenstein of their own will turn on them and most Americans. Yep. Well, uh, okay. Well, there is another uh, person running against Paul Ryan in Wisconsin. So we can just disregard this guy. This guy's not going to get anywhere in a primary against Ryan. Well, we'll see. He might get something, but... He won't be in the general. We know that. But who is running against Paul Ryan in Wisconsin who actually makes sense is Randy Ironstash Bryce. The Ironstash. So uh, uh, he actually, uh, Bryce, Ironstash, synthesized what the Democratic message has been and always will be. And the message that we should be having now. And what is that? That message is simple. Whenever I hear, oh, well, you know, Maxine Waters was giving her a rebuttal, and Joe Kennedy the third was giving his rebuttal, and Kamala Harris gave her a rebuttal, and Cory Burker there, what is the message? You know what the message is? The one message that they all said? We help everybody, and they don't. <laughs> to mention for quite a while that the music that you hear now recently on uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Francis Livings and Greg Poré. Uh, Francis is a great and dear friend of mine down in L.A. And Greg Poré uh, has been involved with Francis Livings in uh, some personal and now mostly professional capacities. And um, uh, great musicians, great. Uh, she's a great songwriter and poet. So I uh, had a little bit of an issue with YouTube. Uh, apparently, um, uh, there's some French uh, or France, chanson française that, uh, you know, they don't like me playing. So, so okay, fine. I won't. I'll play my friends. So there. Okay. Uh, next uh, offering here at the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays is by Travis Geddes. Out of Raw Story, a Trump administration official invested in a tobacco company while heading the federal agency tasked with reducing tobacco use. Gosh, I am so old that I remember remember when that was called a conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. Okay. Brenda Fitzgerald invested tens of thousands of dollars in stock holdings in at least a dozen companies before becoming director of the Centers for Disease Control, according to public records. Purchases include shares of Japan Tobacco, one of the largest of its kind in the world, which sells four brands in the U.S. She doesn't even buy American! Jeez. Fitzgerald, (laughs) okay, get this, a medical doctor and former Georgia Department of Public Health Commissioner, (laughs) <laughs> Maybe that explains why they have so much lung cancer in Georgia and other kinds of cancers that are smoking related. Hmm. Well, she also bought shares in Merck and Company, U.S. food holding company, Bayer and Humana, according to records obtained under the Stock Act. Okay, well, U.S. food holding company, hopefully they're in the U.S. They could be named that and still be somewhere else. She toured the CDC's tobacco laboratory on August 9th, one day after purchasing shares in the Japanese company. Fitzgerald sold the tobacco shares on October 26th and all of her stock holdings above 1,000 on November 21st, more than four months after assuming leadership of the Federal Health Agency. She had to wait until the market was good to do it. Come on. Can't blame her for that. Ethics experts say uh, that 
Fitzgerald should have recused herself from government activities that could have affected her investments in food and drug companies. You don't buy tobacco stocks when you're the head of the CDC. It's ridiculous. It gives a terrible appearance, said Richard Painter. Yeah, I like that guy. Of course, you know, he was the chief ethics lawyer for George W. Bush, which I don't know. Was that guy full of ethics? Hmm. Fitzgerald has been criticized for lawmakers for holding on to some investments after becoming CDC director. But a Department of Health and Human Services spokesperson said her complicated stock portfolio was delaying some transfers. Mm -hmm. Well, you chose to be part of uh, the the crew that wants to uh, give public service. Sometimes you got to take a hit. Sometimes you got to take a haircut. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle. C'est tout. C'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer. Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est tout All right, finishing up here in the Bistro Cafe at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays Will no one rid me of this priest? Is by Christina Maza out of Newsweek Russian-sponsored peace talks for Syria in the Black Sea resort of Sochi descended into chaos Tuesday when angry attendees taunted Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov. Delegates argued over who would run the event, and a group of opposition leaders refused to leave an airport after landing. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov launched the, the event with a statement from Russian President Vladimir Putin that claimed the time was right for Syria to turn a tragic page of history. But some delegates responded by standing up and angrily accusing Russia of killing civilians with its airstrikes. Other delegates responded by shouting out support for Russian efforts in Syria, where Moscow has helped prop up the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Meanwhile, members of an armed opposition group refused to leave the airport at Sochi until Syrian government flags were removed from the event. The issue was never resolved, and the head of the delegation said the group would boycott the event because of the flag and because of Russia's killing of Syrian civilians. Now, Russia has been accused by human rights groups of killing thousands of civilians with airstrikes since it first got involved in the Syrian civil war two years ago. A plenary session was reportedly suspended due to squabbling over who would preside over the event. Dubbed the Syrian Congress of National Dialogue, okay, the event was meant to begin negotiations for drafting a new Syrian constitution, but many key players, including the main leadership of the Syrian opposition, boycotted the event. The U.S., Britain, and France all opted not to attend because they said Syria's government refused to engage properly. Delegations representing Turkey and Iran did attend the conference. Now, Western countries support a separate UN-backed peace process for Syria that has also failed to produce results. Well, come on, send Jared. Netanyahu says that just by dating the fact that uh, uh, Jared is a New York slumlord, he can bring peace to the Middle East. Well, well, why can't he bring peace in Syria? He knows how to run a property management company. Well, does he? Okay, let's get to our break, and uh, we'll come back and give you weather from around the world, and then finish up on the one-year anniversary of Countryman's speech when he left the State Department. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. 
From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. It's Tuesday, January 30, 2018. Believing climate change. Debunking President Trump's latest lies and disinformation on climate science. The United States is not just exporting energy. We're exporting freedom. The U.S. is now importing less oil than ever before, thanks to Obama. EPA reversal on Pebble Mine is qualified good news for Alaska. Plus... While the main impetus for this year's forward movement of the clock was the perilous nuclear situation, climate change very much remains a serious and worsening threat. Thanks to Trump, the doomsday clock has now been moved up to two minutes to midnight. Thanks, Trump. All of those stories and more straight ahead from bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. Uh, uh, there is a cooling and there is a heating. Oh, Jesus, God in heaven. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, the President of the United States, went on British TV and made a complete jackass out of himself and these United States. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. In a semi-coherent interview on Sunday with Piers Morgan for Britain's ITV, Trump exposed his complete ignorance of climate science and U.S. climate policies. You could see his mind reaching to remember what he's been told by Fox News as he lied about how the term climate change was coined, lied about the melting ice caps, and exposed his ignorance on science, which would be comical if it weren't so dangerous. Do you believe in climate change? Do you think it exists? Uh, I there is a cooling and there's a heating. I mean, look, it used to not be climate change. It used to be global warming, right? right? Uh, the ice caps were going to melt. They were going to be gone by now. But now they're setting records, okay? They're at a record level. Okay, so the ice caps are setting records, but it's for melting. According to NASA, sea ice at both poles hit record lows last year. That's both the Arctic and the Antarctic. And it's been called climate change for more than a century. You mean they didn't just come up with that because global warming was no longer working? <laughs> no, certainly not. And NASA, just over a week ago, announced that 2017 was the second hottest year ever ever recorded. So no, the nonstop upward temperature trend for the planet that has been going on for decades continues. Well, who listens to him? He's only the president of the United States. And I just want to note for the record that corporate media needs to stop fixating on whether Republican politicians believe in climate change and they need to start asking what they plan to do about it. Good point. Meanwhile, some good news for Alaskans. In a surprise reversal late Friday, the Trump Environmental Protection Agency announced that it will restore Obama-era restrictions blocking the controversial proposed Pebble Mine. What? A, a massive copper and gold mine that the Obama EPA had determined would irreparably harm the pristine Bristol Bay watershed, home to the world's largest salmon fishery. However, Think Progress reports that EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt did not outright ban the proposed mine. Instead, Pruitt's statement says, quote, the decision neither deters nor derails the application process of the Pebble Partners proposed project. So here we're trying to give some credit for something to Scott Pruitt at the EPA. We can't even do that, huh? Unfortunately, no. Alaska, however, may get an exemption from the Trump administration's plan to expand offshore drilling. That's because the state's Republican senators and Republican House representative have asked Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke to remove much of Alaska's waters from the offshore expansion, similar to how Florida's Republican Governor Rick Scott asked for Florida to be excused. Funny how that happens. Meanwhile, the U.S. is importing less oil than ever before. Net imports of crude oil products into the United States has dropped to the lowest level on record since 1973. And according to U.S. Energy Secretary Rick Perry at the World Economic Forum in Davos, we are now the number one oil and gas producing nation on the face of the earth. That's thanks to the surge in domestic shale oil production begun under the Obama administration. The Trump administration is pushing the world now to use more oil and export even more of our climate disaster to the world. Directly contradictory 
contradictory to climate scientists' warnings that we must get to net zero carbon emissions as soon as possible to avoid catastrophic impacts. Well, there is a cooling and there's a heating. (laughs) Which brings us to the doomsday clock, the iconic symbol that represents the likelihood of man-made global catastrophe, which last week the scientists at the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved up to two minutes to midnight for the first time since 1953. In doing so, the Bulletin scientists condemned not only President Trump's aggressive rhetoric on nuclear weapons and North Korea, but climate scientist Sivan Kartha, a member of the Bulletin's board, also put the blame squarely on Donald Trump's rollback of U.S. climate policies. And of course, he also formally declared his intention to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. In other words, the U.S. president has done his best to follow through on his stated intention of derailing U.S. climate action. Promises made, promises kept. For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Don't forget you can download our reports anytime via Stitcher, TuneIn, or iTunes. Find us, follow us, and share us worldwide on the Facebooks and the Twitters at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. And this has been your Green News Report. After midnight, we're going to let it all hang down. After midnight, we're going to chuggle up and shout. We're going to stimulate some action. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. Got a minute? The giraffe is an icon of the African savanna. The lion is the top predator of the ecosystem. Both animals face uncertain futures, and both are the subjects of intense, ongoing conservation work. Now, a study suggests that saving one might mean bad news for the other. When I was out in the field, um, I heard anecdotes from people that in one of my study sites, there were very few juvenile giraffes because apparently the lions in the area had developed a preference for taking young giraffes. University of Bristol biologist Zoe Muller. Working in Kenya's Great Rift Valley, she focused her attention on two neighboring sites, a national park with lots of lions and a privately owned conservancy with no lions. In the Lion Free Conservancy, 26% of the giraffes were less than one year old. But in a lion-filled park, juvenile giraffes made up only 5% of the species population. So I was able to show, really, that actually in the presence of lions, the number of juveniles is severely reduced um, by actually by 83%, which was a lot higher than I thought it would be, um, and quite shocking, actually. Giraffe populations have declined by some 40% in the last 30 years, with fewer than 98,000 individuals left in the wild. In recognition of those figures, they've recently been classified as vulnerable, that is, likely to become endangered. The ongoing loss of juveniles could lead to a situation where the population crashes, since population growth and stability both rely on having enough calves survive to sexual maturity, so they too can breed and produce offspring of their own. The study compares only two sites in East Africa, but it highlights the extreme complexity of wildlife management in Africa, where the recovery of one species could potentially come at the cost of another. Unfortunately, in East Africa, most of the conservation areas these days are fenced and enclosed. Um, And so this is going to become an increasingly uh, more common problem where we find that predators are being enclosed in specific areas. Allowing for the conservation of both species in the same areas is thus a tricky proposition. Muller says that one possibility might be to translocate giraffes into and out of lion-free areas, or to translocate lions into and out of places with lots of giraffes. If we do that, we may help ensure the two species' survival. But are they still truly wild? Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The founders of our nation believed that the right to hold and express one's beliefs was essential if citizens were to participate in the affairs of government. There are many benefits to freedom of expression. For example, freedom of expression promotes individual development and human dignity. It is important for your growth as a person to have the right to present your ideas and to consider other points of view. 
Your dignity as a person should be respected by allowing you the freedom to say what you think and to hear what others think. Another benefit is the advancement of knowledge. It is easier for new discoveries to be made when ideas can be discussed freely. Even if you disagree with someone, that person may say something that helps you test your knowledge and increase your understanding. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. Does the Fourth Amendment disappear in a rental car? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Terrence Byrd, who was driving a car rented by his fiance on a highway in Pennsylvania in 2014, was pulled over for allegedly not moving back into the travel lane quickly enough after he had passed a slow-moving truck. The trooper who stopped him testified that he was suspicious of wrongdoing because Mr. Byrd was holding the wheel in the driver-instructor-recommended position of 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, and his seat was pretty far back. Okay, those reasons are just transparently stupid, but here's the third one that really did count. This was a rental car. The trooper's license and registration demand yielded the rental agreement made out to Byrd's fiance, and that fact, according to the United States Department of Justice, means that the trooper was free to search the entire car for anything, which he did, and found drugs, which resulted in a 10-year prison sentence. In this criminal justice story, not surprisingly, race matters. Contrary to the common misconception, African Americans generate four times as many retail rental transactions as Caucasians. So far, in court, Byrd has lost. The Court of Appeals ruled that if you're not a listed driver on the rental agreement, then you have no expectation of privacy whatsoever in the car, and the police can search it to their heart's content. We'll soon find out if the Supreme Court agrees. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. Well, thank you for accompanying us from the Bistro Cafe back to the chef's table here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. It could have been a simple frittata, but no, no, we're going to spiff it up with a really nice hollandaise. That's what we like to do. Okay, so now that we're comfortably ensconced at the chef's table, let's start off with a palate cleanser, which is always the weather from around the world, and we start off along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. Which reminds me, in Trump's uh, State of the Union last night, he he didn't say, God bless the United States of America. He just said, God bless America. God bless America. (laughs) Okay. I thought we were the United States of America. But that's where we are now, folks. Uh, could be another few more years or hopefully less. Let's hope. Okay, so it is currently 35 degrees and apparently it feels like 34. I couldn't tell. It felt like, uh, actually it felt warmer than 35 and I forgot to check my garden thermometers to see if it felt around the 40 to 41 that I thought it was against uh, my uh, mammalian syndrome. Okay. And we will have a high of 55 today, a low of around 42. So there you go. All right. And tomorrow we are expecting a high of 60. Uh, Somewhat of a drying out period, only drying out in the sense that there won't be actual rain falling from the sky for a bit. Because it is still a lot of moisture in the air. And uh, But we're going to get up into the mid-60s by the middle to end of next week. Well, that's... That is always subject to change, of course, but I don't know. Pressure is holding at 30.2 inches. Visibility is at 6 miles per hour. We have scattered clouds at a 3,700-foot ceiling. And humidity is 89%. So I'm just telling you, there's a lot of moisture in the air. It's just not falling. Okay. 
So weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And these people live around the world. London is 43 and partly cloudy. Paris is 48 with rain. Rome is 54 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 35 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is uh, gone from smoke to just fog. Hong Kong is 44. Oh, I'm sorry. They're, uh, Kabul is 32 degrees. And they moved from smoke to now having fog. I, I think it's a mix, to be honest with you, at 32 degrees. Hong Kong is 44 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 39 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia, in the dead of their summer, is 65 degrees. Cloudy with wind. Yeah, I know what that means. San Francisco is 50 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York, is 22 degrees and sunny. I think you should go ice skating. Now's the time to go get over there to, uh, I don't know, is it Times Square? It's a CBS building, wherever they have that skating rink. Go there. And that is Weather from Around the World, brought to you by people's personal weather stations. And these people live around the world. Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy at the Chef's Table. Well, we have an essay by Thomas Countryman. Now, a year ago, he delivered his farewell. A year ago, he delivered his farewell remarks to his colleagues, and that was days after he and five other top State Department officials were summarily dismissed. Showed up for work, and they said, "You're out of here." And it seemed like a purge then. It seems like a purge now. And as Paul Ryan said, it's a cleansing. It has a very tetonic ring to it when you put it that way, doesn't it? Indeed. Okay. Now, this was published yesterday uh, on the day of the State of the Union, and it, it's fitting that it was. So, Thomas Countryman uh, writes, One year ago, I retired after the new White House relieved me of my duties. My farewell allowed me to put into public words a topic we don't discuss often enough, the real meaning of love of country. Through 35 years of service and beyond, the United States has held an enduring value, a promise for me and the many public servants with whom I served and who continue to serve in our government. For so many of us in the Department of State, as in the military and other public service, a government career was not ever simply a paycheck, but a way to pay forward the marvelous gift of liberty be bequeathed by our foreparents, to demonstrate our real concern and love for our fellow Americans. Now, happily unemployed, I still have better luck than a lot of people I know. No one in my family has been deported, killed with a handgun, or died from an opiate overdose. I haven't been required to report to a shuttered government office, unsure whether or not I would have work to do or would even be paid. Beyond all that did not happen, I've had the opportunity to begin to pay back my debts to sleep, exercise, and spousal attention. I took a long drive through our beautiful and vibrant southern states, and I have volunteered to serve as chairman of the Arms Control Association, a small, impactful, and, yes, idealistic NGO. However, as most of us know, the rest of the nation has been less fortunate. Start with my former professional home, the Department of State, once the most respected diplomatic service in the world. I had the highest hopes for Rex Tillerson, an intelligent, ethical leader with a reputation for sound management. I have to interject. If you want to know the what, what, how, how has uh, Countryman put it? Tillerson's reputation as an ethical leader. Rex Tillerson 
was a like a Paul Singer, a vulture capitalist. His profits would go up if there was more discord and disarray in the country that they were trying to take their natural resources from. Let's be clear. If we want to know about the solid ethical leader and a reputation for ethics, I would suggest to uh, uh, look at the French movie Le Pluie de Salier, The Wages of Fear. Please do. Then you'll know what fossil fuel types deem as ethical. The irony is that his policy instincts have been solid, for instance, on the right approach to North Korea and Iran, but his management has been to be polite and effective. He presides over sinking morale, internal communication failure, and a decline in influence within the rest of government and with foreign partners. The State Department is becoming marginalized precisely when foreign policy dilemmas are becoming most acute. I would be happier if I could blame amateurs at the White House for the department's problems, but at Foggy Bottom, the buck has to stop on the seventh floor. I don't know whether the secretary accepts that or shares the view of some in the administration that the department creates its own dysfunction. Their view, and perhaps his, reminds me of a film in which a character played by Michael Douglas, criticized for being a lousy father, replies, I was a great father. I got dealt a bum kid. I see little sign from the department's new leadership, and none at all from the White House that they grasp the difference between foreign policy, which must follow the president's priorities, and foreign diplomacy, which is a profession and a skill. State Department professionals, both civil service and foreign service, are ready and keen to follow a new policy on Iran or elsewhere. But they cannot fulfill the essence of their profession, getting inside the decision cycle of other countries if their very professional skills are routinely demeaned. effects of the amateur diplomacy I warned against last year. I marvel at the combination of in ignorance and mendacity required of our vice president to claim repeatedly the U.S. has never been more respected in the world. The complete opposite is true, as demonstrated in numerous opinion surveys. This government has renounced a leadership role in the exact fields that mark the last 70 years as the American century, free trade, human rights, promotion of our democracy, fighting global poverty, non-proliferation and arms control. Our president's pronouncements sound even more like those of President Putin or President Xi, less grammatical than theirs, but equally oblivious to facts. When we vacate leadership, we abandon the opportunity to spread our goals and values. This void is filled by other countries and their interests. As a consequence, American citizens are less secure in their homes and in overseas travel. American businesses are less competitive in foreign markets. And American leaders are less influential in setting the global agenda. And in a topic I work on now, the risk of nuclear war has risen from negligible to remote but conceivable. The damage is not only to American citizens. I have seen countries from Russia to Serbia to Hungary to Poland slide from imperfect democracies into nouvelle authoritarian plutocracies. The White House seems determined to follow the same course, with no meaningful resistance offered by the congressional majority. The U.S. is not in only encouraging the most autocratic of foreign leaders, 
but sapping the spirit of an entire generation of advocates for democracy and human rights in foreign countries. Some of these changes will take years, if not decades, to repair. Other changes will be simply irreversible. I do not shed a tear for my senior Foreign Service colleagues who have left state, most from a combination of deep unease with this administration's approach to the world and the clear signal that the new leadership at state had no further use of of their talent. They have mostly, though not all, landed on their feet, either to my style of semi-retirement to universities or activist NGOs or as candidates for Congress and other offices. Several have moved to the private sector at well-deserved multiples of their government salary. But I do bemoan their loss of service to the American people. Just look at a few people most recently departing. John Feeney, Gina Ambercombe, Ambercombe, (laughs) uh, Wynne Stanley, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. You realize we are losing not just policy expertise, but people who were inspirational leaders and role models for women and minority officers of the next generation. I can continue to encourage my old ollies at all levels to stay the course as long as they can. When I speak at universities, I encourage young people to enter federal service now, despite all the obstacles and moral quandaries. Like many Americans, my faith in our political leaders have been deeply eroded as they show more fealty to money and holding power than to democratic norms. Yet I retain faith that professional federal employees, much more than their political counterparts, take seriously their oath to defend the Constitution. Among the dedicated employees at state, there will be both undeserved casualties and battlefield promotions in recognition of their work, the kind of life events that build the leaders of tomorrow. Theirs is not a political battle, but a struggle to preserve and promote basic American concepts now under attack, principles, and excellence. With distance, I look back at my colleagues still in state with even greater admiration. My career was long, but not as personally trying as it is for many Foreign Service service officers. So many have endured assignments to war zones, physical attacks, hostile surveillance and harassment, long separation from family, all while presenting America's human face to a world wary of our power and skeptical of our intent. It is not a surprise, but it is a blessing that even now they endure. They still believe in the ideals that have refined our democracy and still resist the efforts to course in both our domestic and our foreign dialogues. With a longer view of history than the next election, they continue to work to build the institutions and relationships that will sustain our freedom, our security, and our prosperity. The women and men of the Department of State remain, as I described them last year, firm in their principles, steadfast in their ideals, and tireless in their determination to defend the Constitution. And that is why, even as we struggle to realize the promise of America for this generation's citizens, my faith in our capability to build on this earth a more heavenly kingdom for future generations is undiminished. They deserve our respect and thanks. As my Arab friends would say, may God give them strength. Indeed, Mr. Countryman, indeed. All right, that brings us to the end of our uh, broadcast period for today. But uh, please do join us for tomorrow on Thursday, which is uh, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. That's right, a little bit of spicy jambalaya on Thursday, indeed. Uh, Stay tuned, of course, rest of the day uh, for some great programming and content on Netroots Radio. And we will join you tomorrow on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des terres, 
Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golf clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver